The Tom Woods Show, episode 1848. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Tom DiLorenzo is back with us today. Tom is the author of a whole bunch of books, How Capitalism Saved America, Hamilton's Curse, of course, his very famous book, The Real Lincoln, and a whole bunch of others. He's recently retired as a professor of economics at Loyola University in Baltimore. And I want to talk to him about and have him elaborate on an article he recently wrote for lewrockwell.com that I'll link to at tomwoods.com slash 1848, our show notes page for today, about uh, what he calls America's Stalinist Universities. And uh, there's a lot to be said on this, and we're going to have a great conversation today, I have no doubt. Tom, welcome back. Pleased to be back with you, Tom. I got an email from Kevin Gutzman, our friend, the historian, sure. saying Tom DiLorenzo has just an outstanding article on lewrockwell.com today. You've you got to check it out. So I did. And it was called, in classic DiLorenzo style, America's Stalinist Universities. I, I would have known that was your article, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 100 miles away, right? But yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you were telling stories in here about, and particularly the story about uh, what happened at Sarah Lawrence College. Now that's from, I don't know, is how recent is that? I think it's just a couple of years ago. I think like two years ago, something like that. Yeah. And uh, Professor Samuel Abrams, he was, uh, you know, he's sort of mildly conservative, and uh, he was a little disappointed that everything that went on, all the speaker series, uh, conferences. Everything is 100% left-wingers, never a, a dissenting viewpoint, no intellectual diversity whatsoever. So he, he did a study. He got a sample of 900 uh, university bureaucrats, uh, now, the people like me who have lived in um, academe for all these years. I've taught university economics for 41 years, know that there are huge bureaucracies of, uh, of hand holders, of, of uh, people who have face contact, face-to-face -face contact with students beginning in the uh, uh, freshman orientation. And he asked all 900 uh, what they're, they consider themselves to be liberal, conservative, or whatever. And he said 4% admitted to being conservative. And so, uh, and so he, he, he pinpointed that as the problem, that the people at the universities, the adults, besides the left-wing professoriate, the other adults who have a, a much more personal contact with the students are even more left-wing than the faculty. And he wrote this up in the New York Times. He, wrote, he published an article in the New York Times about it. And uh, as a result, there was the usual organized uh, uh, purge, uh, supposedly signed by students. But these things are always orchestrated, in my experience, by faculty and administrators, calling him a racist for, for pointing out these plain, undeniable facts and calling for his firing. And that's sort of become par for the course in academe these days. Yeah, it's. I don't even know how you can respond to that. It's. Yeah. He's. I mean, like this is a phenomenon that is clearly occurring. Nobody's even denying that it's occurring. Yeah. You're just apparently supposed to sit and take it. Yeah, and most academics do. You know, higher education and the so-called in the U.S. is a socialist institution. All all of the universities are either 100% or partially uh, funded by government. And he who takes the king's shilling becomes the king's man. And of course, there are a couple of famous uh, counterexamples like Grove City College and, uh, and Hillsdale, but uh, you know, so what you know, compared to, to the rest of it? And so the, your typical academic, especially if you're a conservative, uh, you, you, know, you're not gonna, you don't wanna make waves because of that. And you're, they're sort of counting the days to retirement. And conservatives and libertarians, for the most part today in, a, in the academic world, are like gay people were in the 1950s. They're in this closet and terrified that someone will out them, you know, so to speak. And, and that's the way it is. 30 years ago, I had young people, young scholars sending me resumes, uh, you know, asking me, can you help me get a job at the university where you are? And they would say things like, for God's sake, don't let anybody know about my political background. You know, only show them my articles that I published. And that was 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, when I was in school, I mean, I started college in 1990. And yeah, there was some craziness. And overwhelmingly, the speakers who would come to campus 
all had the same point of view, but it was enough. We could laugh at that and, you know, have our own little pranks and stuff. But I don't know that I would want to be in that environment today. It's how much worse it's gotten. Yeah, that's and why. I, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I thought, by the way, I thought even though it's much more vicious now, in terms of numbers, I didn't see how it could get any worse given that there would be maybe one dissenting voice every semester who would show up on campus, maybe one. Yeah. And even that one would attract a big crowd of people wanting to shout him down. And I, I remember thinking at the time, gee, good thing these people are nowhere near the, the levers of power. Don't. <laughs> That's a shame. Yeah. yeah, now they are. Yeah, just a couple, two weeks ago, um, you know, I, I took a buyout uh, in July from uh, Loyola University, of Maryland. So I'm retired from Loyola. Uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse at my age. And, uh, and about two weeks ago, one of my former students, who's the president of College Republicans, uh, asked me if I could do a Zoom conference with the College Republicans. And he said he has about 120 members because they couldn't find any faculty member in the whole university who was not a leftist who could talk to them, you know. And so, and so we did. We had a little an evening Zoom conference. And so they couldn't find a single dissenting voice uh, out there among anybody. And, you know, after the, the notorious Walter Block episode that you and I have talked about, where the university administration uh, libeled up my friend, our friend Walter Block, uh, after that, in my next class, I had a class of um, junior and senior economics majors, and they wanted to talk about this. And they said, well, why don't you sponsor debates? I had a debate series and uh, funded by BB&T uh, Foundation. And uh, why don't you have a debate? Because one of the economics faculty had told them that. They said, De Lorenzo should hold debates. And I asked these students, I told, well, I told them, you know, I've been here at the time 17 years, I said, and I can never remember one debate. I don't remember any debate. And I have never been asked to debate anybody on campus in 17 years. And I asked them, can you think of any debate that's ever been held on campus? And not one could raise their hand and say yes. <laughs> it was because there, there hadn't been. And I told them, that, that's, I told it, them each speaker is a bigger communist than the last. And that, that was a jaw dropper <laughs> in the classroom. It's incredible, honestly, especially when in the medieval universities, they're actually, you know, which we are supposed to laugh at now because they were so stupid and backward. Yeah. The whole culture of the university was centered around debate disputation. Right. That was that was why Thomas, Thomas Aquinas didn't just randomly write the Summa Theologiae in the format in which he did, in which he takes a question, he looks at possible alternative ways of looking at it, and then he goes and refutes those and gives his position. That's because that was what the life of the university was like. Yes. We haven't got that anymore. Now, one thing they'll say to us, though, is that, look, Di Lorenzo, the reason that the faculty is dominated by people with a particular point of view is that we're right. We're the smart people and you are the stupid people. So of course we're not going to have you on our campus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the, the, the reason why they're there is, is government funding. As soon as I got out of graduate school, I taught for a year at state university of New York at Buffalo. And uh, I only lasted a year. It's too cold, too snowy for me, but I published a lot. During that one year, I published five or six academic journal articles in economics and including three in the journal Public Choice. And they're all sort of, you know, not my typical real Lincoln, you know, smash them to bits of writing, <laughs> but these were academic journal articles, but they were still critical of uh, government programs in the area of public finance. And, and I'm a first year assistant professor, and I had one of the senior faculty uh, come to me and very friendly and told me I shouldn't do so much, I shouldn't criticize the government so much. And this was, uh, uh, you know, 1980, when I first got out of graduate school. And so, uh, and that was the very first year. And, I, you know, and ever since then, it's been more of the same. Uh, if government funding means you, you can't you can't criticize uh, government too much or else uh, for fear of government funding. Uh, in, in Loyola years ago, I was invited by the Maryland Chamber of Commerce to go to the state assembly and make a case for lowering the income tax rate in the state of Maryland. So I did. I wrote a short paper up uh, with all sorts of academic references and so forth. And, uh, and I went and I gave my testimony before, before I got back to the campus, which is about a half hour drive from Annapolis. Uh, there was uh, a, a, a big uh, ruckus made on campus because immediately staffers from the Democrats in the legislature called the president of the university to complain that one of his faculty members was, was actually, you know, had the audacity 
to make an argument for tax cuts in front of the state legislature of Maryland. And, and so, of course, you know me, Tom, that didn't affect me at all. But the president at the time uh, was a good man. His name was Father Ridley. He was a Jesuit, an old style Jesuit. And you know what he told me? He said, I told this guy to go play in the traffic. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. The, the, the younger Jesuits were very different. They're all state, mostly statists now. But, but, but this yeah. old Jesuit who was devoted to academic freedom as the old school Jesuits were, uh, uh, he, he told this guy, go play in the traffic. And, and, and well, especially since I don't think they would have objected if you'd gone there and said to that taxes should be raised. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Sure. And then on another instance, the same thing happened. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce again asked me to go and uh, explain the right to work laws and, and make a case for right to work laws, which I did. These are laws that say you have to pay a tribute to labor unions in order to have a job in the state of Maryland. Uh, in, a, in a unionized industry, and, I, and there's no way out of it. If you don't pay them a, a financial tribute, you can't work. And so I, I made the case against that. And the same thing happened. The, the, the Democrats lined the room with about 200 union guys with jackets on, you know, local 798 to intimidate me, and something like that. And so I just went up there, made my case, and went home. Same thing, you know, another bit furor on campus. And, that, and, that's, and I'm sure this is not the only instance. This is how it works in, in the academic world. Hey everybody, we're gonna take a quick break to improve your life in the process of thanking our incredible sponsor, Blinkist. Old Woods here is constantly giving you new books to read, and you're thinking, Woods, how am I supposed to do this? Well, if you really care about learning but you don't have a lot of time, that's where the amazing Blinkist app comes in. Blinkist takes the key ideas and insights from thousands of nonfiction bestsellers, gathers them together in 15-minute text and audio explainers that help you understand more about the core ideas. No fluff, just the indispensable meat of the argument. 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, also history and economics. I like Blinkist because if you have a 30-minute commute, you can consume the equivalent of two books. I very much enjoyed Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, but you'll also find libertarian classics like Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman and For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. I always wanted to ask you something. You wrote a book back in, I guess, 2002 called The Real Lincoln. This became a notorious book. It, it, you already had a reputation, but man, was it solidified and intensified by that book. And then it got a lot of attention because your colleague, in effect, uh, Walter Williams, was a fill-in host for Rush Limbaugh, and he invited you to come on the show and talk about your book. And of course, it's a massive show with a huge audience, and it zoomed up the the ranks on Amazon after that. But I guess what I want to know is, in that book, you were going after the greatest idol in American history, you know, the, the great icon, Abraham Lincoln. How is that possible, right? Who, who could have a critical thing to say there? So my question was, uh, knowing the political makeup of your campus, what was the reaction like? I mean, was there any response to you? Was there from the administration or your or your colleagues? Were did things become even chillier for you? A anything? Uh, well, there no, very little. But right right after that, after I appeared on Rush Limbaugh, um, this uh, crazy man Lyndon Larouche. You remember who Lyndon Larouche was? Oh right? gosh, yeah, the like crazy man. He, you know he's. He, 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 he had just gone out of federal prison for something, and, and, he, and uh, their modus operandi apparently was to uh, latch on to young people who seemed to come from a wealthy family and get them to turn over some of their money to him, and they, and they brainwash them, and they become zealots for Lyndon LaRouche. I think he's God. And so a couple of these characters showed up on my campus with big signs protesting me. I was out of town at, at the time on a, on a speaking tour, but uh, but I was out of town, and uh, and so and and by then the the university administration had turned cowardly, and they thought it was appalling. Even though I told them you know who these people were, and uh, they they left an article in my mailbox in my in the office in the economics department office explaining why they were there, and it was a paper written by Lyndon Larouche. And on when I was on the Rush Limbaugh show. 
we talked about such things. Uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned was one of the things that happened during the Civil War was the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts that essentially nationalized the money supply. And I thought it was a bad idea. And I don't know, the London LaRouche paper said that Lincoln saved America from the international Jewish bankers. Oh. <laughs> so, so that's what they're protesting. I was, I, I actually contradicted Lyndon LaRouche's uh, anti-Semitic theory about the international Jewish banker conspiracy. And uh, but still, the, you know, the provost and the other people at the university, they, they didn't say anything. They didn't defend me or although they did get the police to kick these people out. They, the campus cops kicked these uh, losers off campus. You know, it's private property. And so they did do that. But then, they, you know, they were sort of uh, sheepish toward me uh, after that. But then they turned, uh, they, uh, they, were, they became a little friendlier when one of the only times I was ever invited to speak at anything on campus by the powers that be was when the Iraq war came about. They wanted to have an, an open forum in one evening, uh, basically to oppose the Iraq war. You know, which was a good thing. So I did. So I made the economic case against the Iraq War in, uh, in this forum, and they had a historian and a philosophy professor and a business school professor, and, and there were several who made the case for it, also. But then I had some of the administrators even come up to me or emailed me and uh, and, and said something to the effect that uh, that sort of I redeemed myself. You know, you know the <laughs> Lyndon Larue cases. <laughs> Uh, you know, cast aspersions on me, but I redeemed myself by by doing that. You know, thanks a lot. <laughs> did you did you teach as part of the undergraduate economics department, or were you in the business school? Well, it was a business school, but it was also I taught I taught uh, undergraduates and MBA students over the years at Loyola. It was all, but it's all under the umbrella of the school of business. Well, how about your colleagues in the school of business? I mean, were they at least sort of reasonable to some degree? Oh yeah, and the, and the, the most probably as a general rule in the universities, the business schools are not quite as crazy as the humanities and social science uh, uh, curriculum. And the, you know, I had there were good people in accounting and finance, uh, and, and and some of the marketing people. Uh, they they were good. A lot of them. A lot of them were sort of uh, would come up to me all the time and. And, and would want to talk about economics, but but they would, but like I said, they would do it like we're a couple of gay guys in the 1950s who are hot, you know, you know, not letting anybody know who we are and what we're about. And they would do that in the men's room. I'd see one of these guys in the men's room, and they would talk about some economics, free market economics article. But but they got the message because the university administrators were so intimidating. And, and at this particular university, Loyola University of Maryland, it's very bizarre. They had a a big stable of, of lawyers in the business school. And these are mostly l- people who went to law school and then got a job as a union organizer or some sort of political rabble rouser like that, community organizer. And they got out of that and they got a job brainwashing uh, the young you know, young people and the, their version of socialism. And, the, and so, uh, and so, and they were, they had the, the, uh, the imprimatur of uh, the university administration and everybody knew it. And so a lot of the good people that I mentioned in accounting and finance just kept their mouths shut and wouldn't say anything. What was your own college experience like when it comes to stuff like this? I mean, maybe it hadn't gone completely berserk in those days. Oh, no, no. My own, well, I, I went to college in this, way back in the 70s. And so it wasn't at all like this. Uh, I, I got interested in economics because I had a, 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 my very first economics course was taught by a student of Milton Friedman. And, uh, and so, and he sort of led me along to a lot of the literature that I might not have discovered had I not uh, done that. And even in graduate school, it was the same. Uh, and, you know, I went to graduate school and uh, got my PhD in economics at Virginia Polytechnic Institute before they changed the name to Virginia Tech. And uh, there was a seminar series. A lot of the faculty were either from the University of Chicago, like James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, or they were from UCLA or some satellite campus. Uh, that is, ideologically, they were the, sort of the Chicago School of Free Market Economics. And so that was the uh, the atmosphere that I had in graduate school. It was no holds barred. David Friedman was on the faculty, Milton Friedman's son. And he's a brilliant guy. You know, every bit is smart, if not smarter than his father, as, as far as, uh, you know, IQ and intelligence. And, and David Friedman would just rip into everybody, very, very, you know, gentlemanly. I mean, it wouldn't be uh, antagonistic. 
But that was just accepted, the accepted way of doing things. And that was the old Chicago school of economics. I don't know, uh, you know, the average person doesn't know this, but one of the things they did is they, they, they carried themselves around kind of like how you described Tom with uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and how he came up with his ideas. The famous Chicago school seminar series was famous for being really a rough and tumble uh, atmosphere. And it took a, a, a really uh, a lot of backbone to be on the faculty there and survive for, for, for a number of years. I've heard uh, well-known economists say, well, I lasted five years, but I had to get out of there. And one of the reasons was, you know, if you stood up in front of a class of graduate students and faculty and were giving, make, uh, giving a paper, anything that anybody had thought might be wrong or mis misleading, boy, they pointed it out right then and there, and, and you had to explain yourself. And, and they had a lot of really brilliant people. I think they've had over a dozen Nobel Prize winners on the faculty of Chicago over the years. And so, but that's how they, but the, the whole purpose was to discover the truth. Uh, discover economic truth. And so they carried forward the old way of doing things. And that was my experience also in graduate school. And that's what I expected to see when I got out of graduate school. And I did pretty much for about the first 20 years of my career, but then things have changed nowadays. Not so much in economics as the other areas, but the rest of the university, it really has changed. But economics too is becoming more and more uh, dubious as far as that's concerned. Yeah, well, I'm I'm afraid about in business schools. Uh, I think we can already see where that might be drifting. And then, of yeah. course, there's there's always been that. Well, not always, but for a while, the corporate social responsibility yes. movement. And and it's not like we're we're. I mean, they they phrase these things in a way that it sounds like only an ogre could be against it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they, they intimidate their they they. This is all orchestrated by faculty and administrators. I, I've had for years, I've had students who would take my courses in, in introductory economics, and they would say things to me like, you know, that the case against the minimum wage as a tool of fighting poverty is overwhelming, and you, you just can't argue that. But if I mention it to my roommate, the women's studies major, she'll shun me, and it'll, it'll affect my social life, and she'll spread the word that I'm a you know, whatever, I'm a, a white supremacist or a fascist or something like that because I don't go along with, you know, the, the, the party line of raising the minimum wage. And so they're, they're not even interested. They, they're taught to not even be interested in uh, uh, thinking and analyzing these things. But uh, they're, they're basically taught left-wing platitudes. And, and that's what they're taught. And uh, there are exceptions, of course. But uh, it was just in the past 15 years or so that I, I thought this seems very prevalent. All of a sudden, students are, uh, are talking like this and they're spouting platitudes and they don't even seem to be that interested anymore in, uh, in, in any kind of scholarship. And, and I always really valued, I always had, I would have maybe five or six students in every class that were not like that. And I would be happy to spend all my time with them out of, out of class and help them along, give them readings. And, and and so forth. I even gave away, believe it or not, um, multiple copies of Human Action to undergraduates who would who would get um, a little bit of um, uh, exposure to Austrian economics, and and they would immediately want to read Human Action. So I would I would have extra copies in my office to just give away to them. Well, that's good. That, I mean, that's nice to hear. Yeah. Now, I, I guess what I want to know, because I never asked you, I'm just curious. I don't know actually what you did your PhD dissertation on. Oh, that was ancient history in the seventies, and uh, one of the uh, one of the big topics of research at VPI uh, at the time, among among some of the faculty that I really liked, I took courses. You know, I took uh, three courses in public finance from James Buchanan, the Nobel Prize winner, and I wrote a dissertation on uh, uh, a local public finance issue. I thought that would be a quick way of getting out of school. <laughs> it was a, it was a topic that I knew I could I could write a dissertation on. And get out of there, and and, uh, and so uh, at the time, what was going on was there were a lot of uh, government, local governments in the U.S. that were consolidating, you know, creating like the Metropolitan Government of Nashville, and instead of uh, becoming more and more centralized rather than decentralized, and so that was sort of a big issue in political science and, and in public choice economics at the time, and it was interesting to me and. Uh, and I thought it was the kind of thing, since I had several faculty there who were very knowledgeable about it, I thought I could learn a lot. 
So when I was in graduate school, I was taking Buchanan's classes and, and a few others. Uh, we had to write a lot of papers. Buchanan was big in assigning. You know, every, every two weeks, there was a paper due. But I And if I had the latitude to choose a topic, I would choose a topic that I thought could be incorporated into a dissertation chapter in a, a year you know, a year or so later, which is what it is. So when I finished the uh, comprehensive exams, which I passed all the comprehensive exams, that then you're allowed to start writing a dissertation. I already had uh, much of it written from all these papers I've been working on for Buchanan's courses and, and some of the other courses. So it was local public finance, kind of boring, nothing at all like my, um, you know, smash Lincoln books or anything like that. Well, that actually makes me wonder... Do you, suppose you you were giving advice to you know, a young college student. Would it be just keep your head down, get your degree, and get out of there? Yeah, I think that's the only advice you can give. Uh, you know, um, myself and Walter Block. You know, Walter Block has written uh, an article or two. On, it's probably on BlueRockwell dot com about graduate schools and economics. And you can search for that. But uh, one piece of advice might have been. Uh, you know, try to find the, the most prestigious school you can find. And if there's at least one faculty member there who's open to uh, free market ideas, because your dissertation is what you're going to sell. When you get out of graduate school, you, you'll learn all the same stuff no matter where you go, whether it's George Mason or Harvard, basically in the first two years. And then, but your dissertation, when you go apply for jobs and do job interviews, that's what you're going to talk about. So if you can find one person there who can be your dissertation chairman or advisor, you'll get the pedigree and you can write a good uh, dissertation. Um, I, I think Tyler Cowan took that advice. He went to uh, Harvard, got his PhD there in record time. And there was uh, one guy there named, uh, I think it was Joe Colt, was in the KALT, I think was his name. I think I think I read somewhere, I never talked to Tyler Cowan about this. Uh, he was an undergraduate at George Mason when I was on the faculty there, by the way. But uh, and I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I think I remember reading somewhere where that was his uh, advisor. And he, he was a pretty good free market guy who's written, published in the Cato Journal and places like that. And so that's one bit of advice to a, a young person who wants to get a PhD in economics these days. And, and that's pretty much what I try to do. And then once you establish uh, a publication record in the academic journals, you have more freedom to do other things like write books. And I, I, you know, once once I got tenure at George Mason, and by writing all these academic peer-reviewed journal articles, um, I had more freedom, more latitude to write books, which is what I really wanted to do. Because the, the journal articles, frankly, are sort of a glass beads game where you count up how many blood, uh, glass beads you have. And I've, I've con- after all the years of being a university professor, uh, I've con- come to the conclusion. And what it really is amounts to is the deans, you know, whether you're in a business school or arts and sciences, the deans know that in order to get reaccredited, uh, the currency is as many short academic journal articles as possible. Who cares if anybody reads any of them? It's just numbers. It's a numbers game because that's how the dean can get a bigger and better job as a, as a vice president or a university president. And so the university faculty are basically research assistants for the dean who wants to get a bigger job somewhere by proving that you know, I got us through accreditation uh, and so I can, I can get a job as the provost or, and then eventually the university president. And so that seems to be the currency. Reaccreditation is everything. And I didn't want to spend my life writing five-page journal articles one after another just so some bureaucrat could get a pay raise. And, uh, and so you make it all you make it sound all so mundane, Tom, it is. <laughs> and not elevated. It is. It is. Uh, and, and mundane. Mundane is even uh, an exaggeration for most academics, in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're out, do, do you? Is there any part of you that misses it, or are you just glad to be done? Uh, the most enjoyable part uh, was always, you know, the freedom to write whatever you did. You know, once I got tenure, I, I got. You know, I could, I could pick any topic, and I, I'm not too crazy, but I, I could pick any topic that I thought was uh, both interesting and, uh, and marketable and important, in, in my opinion. And if other people disagreed, well, they'll tell me. They won't read it, and they won't buy my books and things like that. And so uh, that, that was enjoyable. That's enjoyable, but I can still do that. You know, you know I, I was never constrained, as you know. You know, Anybody who writes a book criticizing Lincoln is not somebody who feels constrained by the university bureaucracy. And, uh, but uh, 
The other more enjoyable point part was always uh, students who are generally interested in learning more. And, and I was always willing to go way out of my way and do almost anything, you know, give them, buy them books and send them to BC's university and all that. Uh, because it's a it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to influence people like this in a good way, as far as their own education. And uh, for example, Tom, I had one student came to me as a high school kid in Baltimore, and he offered to work for me over the summer as my research assistant because he, he had read some of my articles in the Freeman. And uh, okay, okay, I just I just basically gave him things to read. I, I didn't I didn't need a research assistant. Then he went to school at the University of Chicago. Economics, the University of Chicago. He's a very smart guy. He got, he got into the University of Chicago, and he and I kept in touch every summer. Would have lunch together when he was back home uh, with his parents. And uh, four years later, uh, he emails me. He said, uh, "I got my dream job." He said, "My dream job at an investment bank in London, and and I owe you, I owe it all to you." He tells me, and I said, "I wrote back. I said, now wait a minute." Thank your dad for making all those big tuition payments. Don't, don't, don't be too thankful to me. But he said he was thankful. I he it all to me because I sent him to Mises University, where he learned about Roger Garrison's from Roger Garrison's lecture on Austrian business cycle theory, which he, he went back to the University of Chicago and wrote several papers on it. And when he interviewed for his dream job in London, this the guy who interviewed him was uh, an advocate of the Austrian business cycle theory, and he was the only candidate who knew anything at all about it. So, so he really, oh. did, so he really did owe his job to me. But you that know. is amazing. And uh, by the way, some people, I have, especially since I have a bunch of new listeners, might not know the Mises University is a program of the Mises Institute. It's a week long summer program that it was extremely important in my own development. And the fact that you did that and that actually turned out to benefit that guy. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not the usual thing to happen. So uh, well, it doesn't but, happen every day, but things like that to some degree happen that have always motivated me, motivated me to, uh, to do that. And definitely for me, if I were on the hiring end and I met a young person who knew about the Austrian theory of the business cycle, that would be the distinguishing thing. <laughs> You're yeah. hired. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, so I miss uh, that type of interaction. But they're, they're, you know, the, in other words, I might get four or five a year like that. But when you and I teach, have to, you know, taught for years at Mises University, uh, we get 150 to 200 like that for a whole week. Uh, yeah. for, for the most part, it's an amazing thing that you have, we have those students who come all this way to study during the summer for a week and it's very intense. It's, it's tremendous. Well, Tom, there are a lot of books of yours that I could very gladly endorse and recommend here. We did mention The Real Lincoln, so I'll, I'll link to that um, at tomwoods.com slash 1848. You have a more recent book on Lincoln that I also like very much, and that is The Problem with Lincoln. Yes, that's the one. That's my latest, published uh, last July by Regnery Publishing. So I'll also link to that. We did an episode on that not too terribly long ago. Right. So I'll, I'll link to that also. So there'll be some good stuff at tomwoods.com slash 1848. Well, thanks again, Tom, for your recollections. I appreciate it. Okay, Tom. Thanks again for having me. And have a great day. Okay, folks, that's going to do it for today. If you like and appreciate what goes on here at the Tom Woods Show, I would be extremely grateful if you checked out supportinglisteners.com. You're going to find a whole bunch of amazing goodies that, you will love, not least of which is membership in the Tom Woods Show Elite, where all the serious Tom Woods Show listeners truly belong. And it's a wonderful place, and it's no longer on Facebook, so you have no excuse now not to hop on in there with me and a bunch of other really wonderful folks who make smart comments, and you learn a whole lot, and you stay up on what's really going on in the world, and you have a bunch of friends now who don't think you're a murderer because you want to eat at a restaurant. So check it all out at supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.